Hello and welcome to Bay College's online lectures for college algebra. I'm Jim Helmer and in this section 5.6 we're going to look for finding the complex zeros of polynomials. Now up to this point we've dealt with polynomials that had integer coefficients and we only looked for the real solutions as we did in the previous section of 5.5. Well now we're going to look at more complex polynomials. Polynomials who may have rational coefficients. They're not nice integers. And we're also going to be finding zeros or solutions in the complex number system. As we can see here, we have some i's. Now, if we look at this, if I were to FOIL this out, the polynomial formed by these two linear factors would be x squared oh, excuse me, minus 1 quarter. And we can see these coefficients of 1, which is a nice integer, but this coefficient is 1 fourth. So we see it's a rational number. And uh, it does have solutions, as we can see. If we were looking for the zeros, we'd have negative 1 half and positive 1 half as zeros. Well, those are real numbers. They're not nice integers, but they are uh, solutions. If we look at this, well, look at these coefficients. We notice that these coefficients are in the complex number system. If I FOIL this out, I'm going to get x squared. And we can see they're conjugates. Hopefully, we uh, recall the concept of conjugates. We're going to return to that soon. If I FOIL this out, the middle terms are going to cancel because they're conjugates. And 3i times negative 3i is a negative 9i squared. Well, i squared, if we recall, is a negative 1. Negative 9 times negative 1 is positive 9. Now, when we tried to factor this, we'd say, hey, this is prime. But now, with, in the complex number system, we could actually factor it in the complex number system. If we set this equal to 0 and maybe use the square root property, we'd find zeros of plus or minus 3i, as we can see when it's written as a linear factor. So before we move on to that, let's look at the theorem of linear factors. If we have a polynomial with real number coefficients, it can be written as a product of linear factors. Product just means multiplication of linear factors. So if we have a polynomial of degree n, we can have n number of factors. Because we recall from previous sections that the highest degree of the polynomial is the number of solutions that we could possibly find. Well, in the complex number system, it tells us that these are the number of solutions we will find, whether they be real or complex. Now, Oh, I forgot an example here. Excuse me. Let me go back to this. Let's look at finding a polynomial with given zeros. And we'll notice that these zeros here, we're looking for a polynomial of third degree with zeros of 2, negative 1, or excuse me, negative i and i. These are those conjugates. Well, they're also in the complex number system. So let's first begin by writing it as linear factors, because a polynomial can have linear factors, can be written as linear factors. Well, the first one we'll have is 2, so it's x minus 2, right? Because 2 is the 0, x would be 2 minus 2 to give me 0. We also have the factor of x minus i, which would be x plus i. And x minus a positive i, which is just x minus i. So we write it as a product of linear factors, but we're looking for the polynomial of third degree. We want to write it out as a polynomial. So let's do a little bit of multiplication here. I'm going to multiply these two together first, because they're conjugates. And I know that middle term will cancel, because I'm going to have positive ix and negative ix. So I can write it as x squared. Uh, i times negative i is negative i squared. i squared is a negative 1. So it just changes the sign to x squared plus 1. You know, kind of like this, x squared plus 9 factored, well, x squared plus 1 factors in the complex number system. And now I can just finally multiply it by this one to have my final polynomial in descending order. I'm going to just use FOIL again, x cubed minus 2x squared uh, plus x minus 2. This is my polynomial function of third degree, notice we have third degree, and it has these zeros. These were our zeros. If we multiply them together, we have our polynomial. All right, so we went from linear factors to the beginning polynomial. All right, now let's move on. And notice one thing we looked at in that example is we had negative i 
and positive i. These were conjugate pairs. The theorem of conjugate pairs says in the complex number system, if a function has real number coefficients, and if a plus bi is a 0, then its conjugate, a minus bi, is also a 0, must be a 0. So if we find one imaginary solution in a polynomial, we must find its conjugate to be a solution as well. So let's look at this example and use this concept in conjunction with what we just looked at in the previous example. Let me just move this down a little bit. If f of x is a 6 degree polynomial with zeros of 3i, 2 minus 3i, 2 and 0, write the polynomial f of x as a product of linear factors. Well, if I am to take this statement, 3i is a solution in the complex number system, then negative 3i, its conjugate, must also be a solution. So I'm just going to write it out as a product of linear factors. I know x minus 3i is one of my zeros. x plus 3i must also be one of my zeros. That's the theorem of conjugate pairs. In the complex number system, if we have an imaginary solution, we also have its conjugate as a solution. We also have this here, 2 minus 3i. Well, x minus, and I'm going to use parentheses here, and I could simplify by distributing that, but it's always x minus the number, minus the 0. And uh, if we realize here, this is also a complex solution, so what is its conjugate? Well, x minus, well, instead of 2 minus 3i, it's 2 plus 3i. That is its conjugate. And again, I could distribute the negative. It's just changing signs, right? And then finally, we have these two, which are real numbers, x minus 2 and x minus 0. Well, that's just x. And I like to keep my single x terms out front like this. Now, it asks us to write it as a product of linear factors. This factor times this factor times this factor, so on and so forth. Let's count the number of factors I have here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This would give me 6 factors containing x multiplied together, which gives me a 6 degree polynomial. And to multiply this out would be long and tedious and uh, a, lot of, a lot of accounting to keep track of all these different terms, but we could do it. And it's not really too bad if you multiply these conjugate pairs together first, because that middle term is always going to cancel out. Just like the difference of squares, well, it's conjugate pairs, the middle term cancels out. So we could multiply it together, but it was only asked us to write it as a product of linear factors. And there it is. That is our product of linear factors. So f of x equals this would give us our polynomial, and it would have real number coefficients. All right, let's move on and see if you can apply that concept, because this is going to be your quiz for this video. It says, find a polynomial f of x of lowest degree with zeros of i and negative 1. Well, let's think about that concept we just talked about. This is a complex solution. So its conjugate must also be a solution or a 0. So if I have i, its conjugate is negative i, so those are my zeros. Find a polynomial of lowest degree. Well, if I have three zeros, what is my lowest degree? Hopefully you know that. And you can write out those linear factors. And because there's only three linear factors, go ahead and multiply them out. It's very similar to the first example we looked at. So try it for yourself. All right, the next thing we're going to look at is applying these concepts to actually solve a higher ordered polynomial. Now, if we have f of x equals 2x to the fourth plus x cubed minus 35x squared minus 113x plus 65, we can see these coefficients are real numbers. Even though they're not very nice numbers, we're getting pretty big, right? Well, let's first assess the polynomial. Oh, excuse me. Drop to chalk here. If we assess the degree of the polynomial, we can see, well, it's fourth degree. And the max number of zeros, well, here's the interesting thing. In the real number system, we said that there are at most four solutions. That's the maximum we could find. 
Well, that holds true here, but what's nice about the complex number system is you're going to find four solutions. Some may have multiplicity or be repeated, but you know, so they may not be unique, but you will find those solutions. So we have four, fourth degree, which means we can find four zeros. So let's first use the concepts we learned in the previous section, 5.5, and see if we can find those real zeros first, if they exist. Well, the first thing we're asked to do is find the positive real zeros. Well, we can use Descartes' rule of sign that we learned in the previous section, and we can just look at this for sign changes. While it's positive, it remains positive, it changes to negative, and then it stays negative, and then it changes. So we're just looking at how many times the uh, coefficient, coefficients signs change, and I saw two. So Descartes' rule of sign says it's either that many, the number of sign changes, or an inter even integer less. Well, an even integer less than two would be zero. So I'm either going to find two or I'm not going to find any. Well, let's look at the negative real zeros. Well, if I put in f of negative x, how does that change my signs? What am I going to get? Well, if I put a negative in here to a fourth power, it doesn't change the sign. It's going to remain positive. If I put a negative in here and cube it, well, that's going to change the sign. If I put a negative in here and square it, it's still not going to change the sign, so it'll remain negative. If I put a negative value of x in here times a negative, well, that's going to change the sign. And the constant never changes sign. That's what makes it constant, right? So now if we look at this, I have a positive that changes to negative. That's one sign change. It remains negative and then changes to positive and stays positive. There are two sign changes from positive to negative, back to positive. So I have either two or zero real zeros for this function. Now, if we recall again from 5.5, the previous section, we can find the potential rational zeros by essentially taking p, our co the uh, coefficient of the constant, over our q, the coefficient of the leading term. p over q. Well, I've already written them all out. We have 65 over 2 and all the different factors that would make that. Plus or minus 1 half, plus or minus 5 halves, 5, 13 halves, 13, 65 halves, and 65. Now in the previous section, we could use synthetic division to find which one of these is going to work. And because there's so many of them, we want to narrow it down. So maybe at this point, you'd want to pause the video, pull out your calculator, Plug this into your calculator, and then just change your window so you can see where are these zeros, where are these x-intercepts, and narrow this list down. And if you do that, or have done it, maybe, I don't know, you could pause it, you'd see that positive 1 half and positive 5, I'm just going to write them right here, are the closest zeros that you can see on your calculator, depending on what your window setting is. You can say, hey, that's a pretty close value. Well, let's just narrow it down to those values and try them. Another method is we could use the uh, zero remainder theorem and plug these values in. Now, these are big, ugly numbers. And maybe we'd want to use a calculator to see if f of 1 half gives me 0 or f of 5 gives me 0. But let's. Let's trust our calculators and our eyes and say that these are the zeros. Let's factor them out. And we can factor these out by essentially using synthetic division, something we reviewed in the previous section. So my first zero, I'm going to use 1 half. And if I do that, I, using synthetic division, I just rewrite the coefficients. I have 2, 1, negative 35, negative 113, and positive 65. And now, just using synthetic division, I bring the first term down. Half of 2 is 1. 1 and 1 is 2. Half of 2 is 1. Negative 35 and 1 is negative 34. Half of negative 34 is negative 17. Ne negative 113 and negative 17 is negative 130. Half of negative 130 is a negative 65. Well, 65 minus 65 is 0. That's a great sign. That tells me that this, in fact, is a factor, that I was correct in my assumption when I looked at my graph. There is 0 remainder, which means it is a factor. So I know that x minus this 0 is a factor of this polynomial. Now, what is 
the degree of this polynomial? Well, if we think for a moment we just took a fourth degree, we assessed that to be a fourth degree, and we divided it by a linear factor, a first degree. So that decreases this by one degree. And here we have the quotient of our division. I divided this out, so this times this gives me the original uh, polynomial. Well, let's try that 5 that we found. We've already dealt with this 1 half. We took it out. Now, I don't have to divide this into this because this contains this as a 0, this factor, because essentially I just divided this piece out. This still contains the zeros of that. So what I can do is I can do synthetic division again, but now I have this smaller polynomial. So I can say coefficient of 2, coefficient of 2, coefficient of negative 34, coefficient of negative 130. And now I can just use synthetic division. Bring down that first term. 5 times 2 is 10. 10 and 2 is 12. 5 times 12 is 60. 60 minus 34 is 26. 5 times 26, let's see, 5 times 20 is 100. 5 times 6 is 30, 130. Well, that is awesome news, right? Because negative 130 plus 130 is 0. I have no remainder, which means this is, in fact, the 0. It is a factor of this value. There is no remainder. So I know I could factor out x minus 5. Now let's just for a moment pause and look back and say, Descartes' rule of sign says that we could find either 2 or 0 positive real zeros. And we did find two of them, right? So we this held true. Now, the negative zeros, well, if we assess this just for a moment, we divided a cubic polynomial by a linear polynomial, this right here. Well, that just reduces this factor by one uh, degree, right? So now, if I look at this, well, this is a quadratic. We have all the tools up to this point in algebra to solve a quadratic. So what I can do at this point is I can say, well, let's just use the quadratic formula. x equals negative b, which is going to be negative 12, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 144, minus 4 times a, which is 2. Oh, let's clean that up a little bit. Times c, which is 26, all over 2 times a, 2 times 2 is 4. And now we can do a little bit of simplifying in here. And if I go, well, 4 times 26 is 104 times 2 is 208. And I'll just write it up there. 144 minus 208 is a negative 64 under that square root. And I say, whoa, hold up on the car wash. I see a negative under that square root. I know right now I'm in the complex number system. I'm looking at that discriminant, and it's saying, hey, negative under the square root, that's i. So let's simplify this a little bit. Uh, I'll actually, let's pull it back this way, where I have some board space. I have negative 12 plus or minus the square root of negative 64 is 8i over 4. And we can simplify this. And we always want to write our complex solutions in a plus bi form. Negative 12 over 4 is negative 3. Plus or minus 8i over 4 is plus or minus 2i. Notice I have a conjugate pair here. One of my zeros is x minus negative 3 plus 2i and x minus negative 3 minus 2i. And of course, I could distribute that negative. But if we think about it, we've already done all the work. I have this factor times this factor times this factor times this factor. There are four solutions, two of them being real, two of them being in the complex number system. And again, let's back it up and look at this. The number of negative real zeros that I could find was 2 or 0. Well, there are 0 real negative solutions. It turns out that they're imaginary. But they did exist. We found four solutions to this fourth degree polynomial. Let's finally write this as a product of linear factors. I found x minus 2, or excuse me, x minus 1 half to be a linear factor. I found x minus 5 to be a linear factor. 
And now when I write this one, I'm going to distribute that negative. x plus 3 minus 2i. And x plus 3 plus 2i. And we can see we have these four linear factors for a fourth degree polynomial. So it's a lot of work, but we can solve higher ordered polynomials, whether they have real solutions or complex solutions. This, honestly, is going to take some practice. We have to take all the uh, tools that we learned in previous sections, like synthetic division and uh, conjugates and the complex number system, and be able to put it all together to write it in its linear factors so that we can see its zeros. This has been section 5.6. Thank you for watching.